Okay, uh, good evening everyone. Uh, <clears throat> so let's first have uh, a very, very brief review of, of uh, what we learned uh, last week. Uh, last week we discussed uh, <coughs> expected value of uh, discrete random variable, right? So what is uh, expected value? Actually, uh, it can be understood as a long-run uh, sample mean, right? So <coughs> you repeat a, a, a random experiment many, many times, and each time a uh, random variable, you take a value, and you take the average. So this average is called a uh, sample mean. And as the <coughs> number of uh, uh, experiments uh, goes large, then the sample mean will converge to a number. So this, this number is uh, deterministic. It can be fully determined by the distribution uh, according to uh, this formula. So for a <coughs> discrete uh, random variable, the expected value so should be computed in the following way. We take a summation over all possible values this random variable may take. And for each uh, possible value, x, rho is x, so we put a weight. So, so the weight is just the probability this random variable uh, takes this uh, rho is x. And then this uh, weight of the sum is, uh, is called expected value. As I said, the, over a long period of time, the simple mean uh, will converge to this, is the back, uh, this expected value. And actually, uh, this result is uh, is the very well known uh, strong law of large numbers. So, so this uh, this theorem just uh, talks about what I explained just now. So the sample mean will converge to uh, expected value as the sample size uh, goes to infinity. And then uh, we explain how to calculate expected value of a function of a random variable, right? So this is the very important result. So I think it must be very clear of this. How to calculate that? So here we use uh, age for a function. Uh, because uh, this uh, random variable x, uh, this capital X is a random variable, then the function of a uh, random variable is, again, a random variable. And how to calculate this expected value of h of x? So the idea actually is a pretty straightforward. Uh, we, we take a summation uh, over all possible values this random variable x can take. And add each possible value, then we evaluate this function h at this value. And uh, so this result it should be weighted by the corresponding probability, right? So then this weighted sum is the expected value of a function of a random variable. So then uh, we consider a special case. If this function is taken so as this form, so if this mu is the expected value of a random variable x, and the expectation of x minus mu square is called variance. The square root of that is called a standard deviation. So why we bother to introduce this uh, notion called uh, variance? Because uh, as I explained last week, we usually use this variance to measure the variability of uh, the variable, right? So here I explained last week we have two distributions uh, as here. So the first one, the second one. And you can see that the second distribution looks fatter. Right? It covers uh, a wider range. And as a result, uh, <coughs> with a bigger probability, so the second runner variable may take a value that is far from the center. And according to the definition of the variance, so the second distribution should also have a bigger variance. Right? So this is why we need this variance, because um, we wish to use that to measure the variability of a random variable. The bigger, the bigger the variance is, more variable the random variable uh, would be. And then uh, we introduce the certain uh, 
certain uh, discrete distributions. The simplest one is the Bernoulli distribution. So what is the Bernoulli run available? Actually, it's a pretty simple. We just need to think of uh, selecting a coin. But this time, this coin may not be a fair coin. The probability P, it will show has with probability 1 minus P, it will show tails, right? If it shows has, this random variable takes 1. If it's tails, it, it takes 0. So then such a random variable is called Bernoulli random variable. So Bernoulli random variable is, uh, is the simplest one. So I think you need, to, you need to be very clear that the expected value of that is simply equal to P, and the variance is P times 1 minus P. Uh, <coughs> and from this uh, uh, Bernoulli trial, then we can think uh, if we flip this coin, then the number of flips until we see the first that has is a random variable, right? And last week we discussed that, so this random variable is called geometric random variable. So because it's just the number of flips until we see the first that has, if it takes value k, so which means that the first k minus 1 flips are all tails. So the probability of that should be 1 minus p to the power k minus 1, right? And the k flip is tail, uh, is has, so you see, so that's the probability. So you see, for a geometric random variable, it must have a, a probability mass function like this. And last time, uh, <coughs> I showed to you how to uh, calculate the expected value of that, which is 1 over p. And also, uh, at the end of uh, last lecture, uh, we discussed this uh, binomial random variable. So what is a binomial random variable? So again, we flip this coin. Uh, this time, we flip n times. The number of has among those n flips is a binomial random variable, right? So according to this definition, you can see that this binomial random variable is just the sum of n Bernoulli random variables, right? So then, uh, what is the probability mass function of that? So, because we need to flip n times, the probability that we see k has should have n choose k different combinations, different choices, right? And for each choice, we have k has and uh, n minus k tails. So the probability for each case the probability, the corresponding probability should be p to the power of k times 1 minus p to the power n minus k, right? So this is the probability mass function. And I also explained that the expected value of a uh, binomial random variable because uh, it is just the sum of the nullies. So the expected value of that is just uh, n times the expected value of a uh, Bernoulli, so which is p, right? So it's uh, n times p. And the variance of that is just uh, n times the variance of uh, the newly run variable, so which is np times 1 minus p. So I think it's uh, what we discussed last week. And this time, maybe uh, let's think of uh, a special case of this uh, uh, binomial run variable. So here, so we consider such a case. So it, it is still the Bernoulli trial. We still flip a coin. So this coin is a bit special in the sense that the probability that it shows has is very small. So that is to say, so this lowercase p is a very small number, close to zero, far from one. So very small, 0.001, but even smaller. So then, because uh, this, you flip this coin, the chance that you see has uh, just by one flip would be extremely small, right? So then, if you wish to see has, most of the time, you need to flip it many, many times, right? So then, let's consider this case. You have, the, you have such a coin, and you need to flip many, many times. So in a way that, so n times p, so here, n is the number of flips, n times p, is neither too small 
or to wash. Again, the idea is like this. P is a small number. Because P is too small, if you wish to see a number of heads, you need to flip many, many times. So N must be large. So P is small, N is large. The product of them may not be, could be a moderate number. So we use this lambda for the product N times P. So we assume that it is a moderate number. Moderate means maybe just uh, equals to 2, 5, 10, or something. Neither small nor big. So in this case, let's say, let's consider what is the probability that through those n flips, we will see k hat. So, so I have some derivation here. So again, idea is p is small and n is large, right? And n times p is equal to lambda, which is a moderate number. So we wish to we wish to uh, calculate the probability that we will see k hats. So of course this is just a binomial and a variable, right? So n times flip n times. What is the probability that we will see k hats? So we just follow the uh, EMF of uh, binomial. So n choose k times p to the power of k or minus p to the power of minus k, right? So then uh, let's do so a little bit of uh, manipulation. So we expand those terms. Here, uh, n choose k, we know that it's, uh, it's, this, it's this guy, right? So the numerator is n times n minus 1 up to n minus k plus 1. Denominator is just a k factorial, right? And here, uh, because uh, we suppose this lambda is a moderate number, so let's just fix this lambda. Because later we will, we will make, we may, so let p be smaller and smaller and n be bigger and bigger. But we will fix this lambda. If we fix this lambda, then because both n and p will change, it will be more convenient uh, for us to let just one of them change, right? So here, we just use uh, lambda over n to replace p. So we call that lambda is equal to n times p, so p is equal to lambda over n, right? So you see this term, this lambda over n to the power of k is simply p to the power of k, right? And the other term would be 1 minus lambda over n to the power of n minus k. So this is just what we did in the previous step. So now uh, let's, uh, let's do a bit more uh, expansion. So what do we need to do here is to, so you see here we have a term n to the power of k, right? So for this term, we move this term. We replace, uh, we switch this term with this k factorial. So why we would like to do so? Because uh, we see that in this term, there there are n's in the in the numerator, and there's a, another n here. So we just uh, combine them together, put them in the in the same fraction. And uh, because uh, so here, so this term would be lambda k over k factorial, right? So we like this term because it's also lambda and k are fixed numbers, right? And then for the last term, we just expand this term into the product of two terms. The first one is lambda, uh, 1 minus lambda over n to the power n. The other one is 1 minus lambda over n to the power uh, minus k. So, so now we have this one. So then. So given this expression, so next we will do something like this. So we will, because uh, here I said that n is a big number, p is a small number, right? So when, let's see when n goes to infinity, what will happen? So first, let's, let's check this uh, uh, fraction. So here, in the numerator, we have, uh, it's the product of uh, k numbers, right? 
So then we just, so this guy, we just express this guy as the uh, product of uh, k fractions. So here, we know that this k is a fixed number. So each term will converge to 1. And uh, as a result, when n goes large, so the product of all of them will go to 1. Will go to 1, right? So this is the first limit. For the second term, because uh, both lambda and k are fixed numbers, so then we just uh, leave it there. And for the last term, for the last term, because uh, this lambda is fixed and n goes to infinity, this k is fixed. So we can see that actually this term will converge to 1. So now the only term is, uh, the only remaining term is this uh, uh, 1 minus lambda over n to the power n. So, so what is the, the limit of this term? To, to find out the limit of this term, maybe uh, let, me, let me remind you of some, some result like this. So first, I think uh, in calculus, so we know that as n goes to infinity, 1 plus uh, 1 over n to the power n, so this guy has the limit e, right? So the Euler number. So this limit is e, and uh, you also need to know that so if uh, the limit of 1 minus 1 over n to the power n, so that limit is uh, d, 1 over e, right? So, so this, is, this is the limit we need to use. So what we really wish to know is the limit of, of this guy, right? So actually, it's, a, it's this limit. What is this limit? So this limit, actually, so this, uh, uh, the power is n. Because we wish to use uh, so, the, so this, this limit result. So then the trick is this uh, n, the power, uh, should be written as n over lambda times lambda. So then you ask me why bother to do this because uh, as uh, n goes to infinity, so because uh, this term, this lambda over n is just the inverse of n over lambda, right? So we know that, so this term, the term, the term in this pair of parentheses will have a uh, limit 1 over e, right? So again, so this, this guy will have uh, so this limit. And because uh, the limit is within the uh, parentheses uh, has this limit, so the limit of, so all of uh, the limit of, uh, so this guy should be e to the power minus 1. So now we have this, uh, this result, right? So according to this discussion, you can see that if uh, n is a large number and p is a small number, then the probability that uh, we see exactly k has should be close to uh, this expression, right? So I call it, I call it this expression in blue. So, so this blue one should be close to this blue one. Lambda <coughs> to the power k over k factorial uh, times e to the power uh, lambda k. Right? So that's, a, so that's the case. Please keep in mind, that's the case. We flip up to such a coin. The probability to see has is very small, and we need to flip many, many times. Then over n flips, the number of has, roughly speaking, so follows this distribution. So the probability is like this. Right? So that's a... <coughs> what I discussed here, so then uh, let's go back to, to the slides. And you see on the slides, that's exactly uh, what I discussed just now. So then you may ask me the question, why bother to do this, right? And actually, because uh, so this, you know, this limit case is, uh, is called distribution. So 
before I give you some further discussion, uh, further introduction uh, of this uh, possible distribution, so maybe just uh, uh, I give you the definition of that. So what is a uh, possible distribution? Uh, it is just uh, defined through its uh, probability mass function. So if a random variable x that takes uh, value k, so this k could be 0, 1, 2, all the negative integers, the probability that it takes k is equal to this expression, which is exactly what we derived just now, right? So then, so such a random variable is called a Poisson random variable. So this Poisson random variable has only one parameter. So this parameter is called lambda, right? And uh, again, as I said, it's defined through its uh, probability mass function. So now, according to, so this definition, so let's see what properties should this uh, Poisson random variable should have. So first, uh, because uh, the PMF is defined like this, I think uh, I leave it to you as an exercise to verify that it's, uh, it's indeed a probability mass function. So which means that if we sum up for k from 0 up to infinity, so then we will receive, we will have 1. So if you have time, check this. And uh, <coughs> What is the expected value of this uh, Poisson distribution? So here, so maybe let's recall how did we get this uh, Poisson distribution. What we did just now is just a flip a coin, right? So, so many, many times. And uh, this Poisson distribution actually is a limit case of a binomial distribution. Right? So, for the binomial distribution, we know that the expected value of that is uh, n times p. Right? So, here for Poisson distribution, p, we just think of that as a, a limit case of binomial distribution with p extremely small and extremely large. But n times p is moderate, which is equal to lambda, right? So accordingly, so you would expect the expected value of this Poisson random variable should be equal to lambda, right? So that's uh, exactly here. <coughs> then, so what is the variance of uh, this Poisson random variable? So let's, vary, let's recall that. Uh, for the binomial case, the variance of that is n times p times 1 minus p, right? But here, so what is a Poisson distribution? Poisson distribution means, so, the, so we need to let this n goes to infinity, and p is equal to lambda over n, right? This lambda is a given parameter, it's a fixed number. When n goes to infinity, so this p, which is equal to lambda over n, will go to zero, right? So then let's check this variance. So this variance, this n times p should be equal to lambda. One minus p will converge to one. So as a result, so you see the variance of uh, this Poisson distribution should be equal to lambda because uh, so this lambda is the limit of this n p times 1 minus p, right? So this is the, the idea. So actually, so of course, this is just a very intuitive explanation. If you really wish to verify that, you need to plug in some numbers within, uh, for, with this uh, probability mass function. You check that, but it's, uh, it's been more difficult than this. So if you're interested, then I think, uh, you can check that. So now, you may ask me the question, why bother to, to introduce this uh, Poisson distribution? So why we wish to study a limit case of this uh, 
on the distribution, right? So I think this is because uh, uh, this Poisson distribution can be used to describe a lot of uh, uh, phenomena, uh, phenomena uh, with uncertainties. So maybe let me uh, give you an example so that we can have a better understanding of this uh, Poisson distribution. So uh, I think uh, most of you know that uh, several days ago, so there was a, a big earthquake in China, right? And people died. I think uh, so far more than 100 people uh, died of this uh, earthquake. So maybe let's think of a, a problem like this. So suppose that within the region, we have uh, the record of earthquakes in this region over the past 100 years. So we know when did they happen and the, the numbers, magnitudes, and so on. And based on this record, so I wish to estimate the number of earthquakes in the next 20 years. So of course, this is a, a meaningful question because uh, it, uh, it's about disasters. So, and then, uh, so suppose that maybe within the past 100 years, so there were exactly, say, uh, 20, 20 major earthquakes. Major earthquakes means the magnitude of that is bigger, bigger than certain, certain threshold. So usually it should be bigger than uh, 7.0. So we wish to estimate the number of uh, earthquakes in the next 20 years. So because in the past 100 years, we have exactly 20 earthquakes, so then I think it would be reasonable to estimate the expected number of earthquakes in the next 20 years it would be just uh, one-fifth of uh, 20, which is 4, right? However, you may realize that a single number may not be very useful. We will be more interested in the distribution of that number. So that number is what will happen in the, uh, in the future. So definitely, it is a random variable to us. So we wish to know the distribution of this random variable. Again, the number of earthquakes in the next 20 years. So how to model this? Of course, I'm not a geologist. I don't have uh, much knowledge about earthquakes or whatever. But for, but for this problem, I think it may not be very difficult to, to think of that. So because uh, we know that for earthquakes, so the chance that it will happen in a particular day would be very, very small, right? And uh, if we can assume that the geological activities in this region would be pretty regular in the next 20 years, so which means that so the, the behavior of those uh, geological activities in the past would be very similar to what will happen in the future, then so maybe we can model so the, the number of earthquakes as something very simple like this. So as I said, we know that the earthquake will be on any particular day. So the probability will be extremely small, right? So we can just imagine it's just like a flip of coin. So with the so this coin, the probability showing it has would be extremely small, right? For each day, we flip a coin. If it has, which means that there will be an earthquake. But of course, P is small. So we wish to study the number of earthquakes over a long period of time. So which means that for each day, we flip it once, but we need to flip many, many times. We need to flip it for 20 years. 
right? So then, in this case, <coughs> you see what distribution should this uh, number of earthquakes should follow. So it should be like this, also on distribution, right? Why is so? So even if I don't have uh, much knowledge in geology or whatever, but based on very simple assumptions, so the assumption is that the ge uh, geological activities will be regular in the future, then I can simply model this as floating points, right? So in this way, you can see, based on very general, very simple assumptions, there will be a lot of phenomena similar to this. So which means that the number of occurrences of certain phenomena may follow a some distribution. So maybe I can give you another example. So <coughs> let's consider a soccer match, a football match, right? So you may think, so for a football match, what will be the number of goals in the match? So what kind of distribution the number of goals should follow? Actually, we can use the same idea. So for each minute, minute, we just flip a coin, right? So this coin has a small probability of has. So P is small. We flip it, it just has, so which means that there is a goal. If it tails, no goal. Then <coughs> we just flip it for 90 times. So then the sum of those 90 Bernoulli random variables would be the total number of goals, right? P is small and it's large, so which means that actually, so the number of goals in a soccer match should approximately follow this Poisson distribution, right? And actually, so <coughs> you may you may argue with me, say, is this really true? Because uh, you know I'm a I'm a soccer fan. I know that. So the chance that uh, the both teams have goals in the second half of this game, so the chance will be bigger, right? So in this case, is your model still works? Does it still follow a Poisson distribution? Actually, so I think the answer is yes. It still follows Poisson distribution. Why? Can I say so? Because uh, you can think of that in this way. So suppose that you know that so the second half may have uh, more goals. Then so you can model so such a such a case. So in this way, maybe for the for the first half, we flip it the coin every minute. For the for the second half, because you know that the chance of goals is bigger, you flip it more frequently. Maybe every 40 seconds you flip it once, right? In this way, you can see the second half tends to have more goals. But because the number of goals within the entire match is still a number of, the, the, is still the sum of a lot of Bernoulli random variables. So things the sum will still be close to this uh, Poisson random variable, right? So this, so, so you see that even if the second half may have more goals, the modeling technique still works. So based on this explanation, you can see the number of goals should follow Poisson distribution. And actually, <coughs> if you check literature, if you check Wikipedia, whatever. So I think based on historical records, so no matter if it's a number of earthquakes or number of goals or number of uh, uh, customer arrivals within a certain period to the uh, MRT station or whatever, so all of them follow, at least roughly follow, so this uh, some distribution, right? So here you can see uh, this would be very useful. So, uh, any questions? And 
also, this Poisson uh, distribution um, is useful also because uh, it can be used to approximate uh, binomial distribution when n is large and p is small. So for computational reasons, but sometimes if you wish to calculate this directly, if n is large and p is small, it may not be, so the numerical results may, may not be very accurate. Because, uh, so this n choose k would be a, could be a very, very large number. But this p to the power of k could be a very small number. If you have some uh, numerical experience, you may know that. So using computer to, to calculate the product of a, a big number and an extremely small number, so then sometimes it won't be very accurate. And sometimes it could have some issue with that. But if uh, you use uh, uh, so this uh, Poisson approximation, and because uh, as we assume, that so both lambda and k are just a moderate number, and it's neither too large or too small. So this number will not have numerical issues, right? So that's another reason why we like uh, uh, Poisson, Poisson distribution. But here, uh, I'll give you a very simple exercise example. But here, uh, suppose that the probability a traffic light fails in a day is uh, 1 over uh, 3650. So, which means that the a traffic on average, the traffic light uh, can be used for 10 years, right? Then suppose that there are uh, 10,000 lights in Singapore, and what the probability of no failure within a day? So this one, I think it's a uh, pretty straightforward because uh, the probability is just a one over 10 years and there are uh, 10,000 lights. So P is that number and is 10,000. So here, uh, N times P is just uh, 10,000 over 3,000 something. So we can see it's, uh, it's roughly three, right? So it's uh, neither small or large. So if, we'll, if we wish to know the probability that, so this y, which is the number of failures within a day, so the probability that it, it, it is equal to k actually follows this, this expression. But if you really wish to calculate this uh, for a given k, it may not be very convenient. But you can use the Poisson approximation to use this lambda to replace n times p and use this formula. And this formula is lambda to the power of k over k factorial times e to the power of minus lambda. So because we wish to know the probability that k, what is the probability that there's no failure, so k should be equal to zero. k equals to zero, so we just uh, plug this number in this uh, expression. K is zero means the numerator is zero. Uh, factor, uh, the denominator, uh, sorry, the numerator is one. Denominator is one, right? So it is simply equal to e to the power uh, like this. And uh, it turns out that it's around 6%, right? So from actually here, you can see uh, in this example, you can see even if each traffic light is, uh, is pretty stable, so which means that on average it can be used for 10 years. But as long as we have a, a lot of lights in Singapore, so then the chance that there's no failure within one day will still be very small, right? And uh, roughly speaking, it follows so this uh, expression. And, uh, so, so this is uh, a six percent. And uh, uh, I show you some some picture of uh, of uh, uh, Poisson distribution. So this is the probability mass function of uh, a Poisson random variable with different parameters. So 
recall that there's only one parameter for Poisson distribution, right? So which is called lambda. And this, and this lambda is also the expected value of this uh, uh, distribution. When lambda is equal to 0.4, so the distribution looks like this. So, but you need to know that actually, so I can take any non-negative integer value. But here, the only log for up to 10 for this distribution. It doesn't mean I can only take value from 0 up to 10. It can be anything. But you see, so after so the major several points, the probability will be very, very close to 0. Right. And then this is for lambda equals to 0.4. This is the lambda equal to 2. This is lambda equal to 10. So you can see that, as I just said, this lambda is just the expected value, or in some sense, it's the center of the distribution. If lambda is small, of course, because it, it must take the negative values, of course, you can expect that. So the, the, the center of the distribution will be close to to that end, right? So to that end, and the, it will look thinner. And when lambda increases, the center of the distribution will move, will move from from left to the right side. So this is the Poisson <coughs> distribution. And the, you see that the location, both the location of the shape is affected by lambda because it is the only parameter. I think it would be interesting to compare um, Poisson distribution with the Banana distribution, right? Recall that uh, last week we discussed uh, Banana distribution. Uh, I said that so we have two parameters, N and P, right? And both will affect the, the location and shape. But here, if we compare so binomial distribution with Poisson, we may have a better understanding of uh, binomial distribution. So here, let's see the first picture. So in the first picture, blue dots are the distribution for binomial when n is equal to 10, p is equal to 0.2, right? So n is equal to 10, p is equal to 0.2, n times p would be 2, right? So to compare with that, I just uh, uh, plot a Poisson distribution with parameter 2, so which is uh, the green dots. So I see that they're different, but uh, the shape looks pretty similar, right? So again, binomial has two parameters, and the Poisson has only one parameter. But you see, they're close, so which means that although both N and P will affect the location and shape of a binomial distribution, but what really matters, or what matters most, would be the product, N times P. Right? So as you can see here. And in the second, in the second picture, so for the binomial, one, I take n 100 p two percent, and n times p is still two, right? Here, you see the blue dots and the green dots almost the same, right? Because uh, as I said, if p is small and it's large, then the binomial distribution should have a Poisson approximation. It should be close, right? And uh, for the for the uh, two pictures uh, in below, so then uh, I take different parameters. The third one, n is 50, p is 0.2. Accordingly, lambda is equal to 10. In this case, you see, uh, actually, they're close, but not, not exactly the same. If I take n to be 500, to be 2%, and uh, I use lambda to be 10, you see it's, uh, it's very, very close, right? So that's a comparison of uh, 
and on you and on your personal distribution. So the question, uh, purely due to the assumption of personal and small key and small human conversion. Yes, I think so. Uh, because as, as we explain here, so the Poisson approximation would be better if n is larger, right? Or if we keep this longer phase, n is larger means p is smaller. So as you can see here, there, actually, if we compare those two pictures, well, the Poisson distribution would be the same, the same Poisson distribution, right? But for binomial distribution, those two binomial distribution, although they have the same n times p, but the values of n and p are different, right? But when p is smaller, n is larger, p is smaller, you see the approximation is better. So I think it's, a, it's exactly what we discussed again. As n goes large, so then, uh, this binomial will converge to a Poisson distribution. I think that's uh, all I wish to uh, let you know for uh, discrete distributions. Uh, before we start a new topic, uh, is there any question? Or you can just uh, send me a message. Okay, so let's uh, discuss uh, continuous random variables. So maybe, uh, let me first remind you the, the definition of a continuous random variables. What is that? So uh, a random variable X uh, is called a continuous random variable if it can take uncountably many values and for each value, the probability that it takes that value is equal to zero, right? So this is uh, this is we discussed several weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago. Uh, here, uh, let me remind you, uncountable sets uh, could be real line, the set of uh, positive real numbers, uh, the set of negative uh, real numbers, or any interval. On the real line, as long as the interval has, has some length, which is uh, not zero. So this is the <coughs> definition of uh, continuous random variable. Uh, and uh, I explained in the past that so why why we need to classify random variables as discrete ones and continuous ones because uh, we need to use different tools to study their distributions. And for uh, this continuous random variable, uh, as I explained, it could be confusing because uh, the probability that it takes any specific value is zero. However, it takes the probability over the entire real line must be equal to one. All right, so then why this can happen? And I think uh, two weeks ago I explained that because uh, over a convo set, you cannot, you cannot define addition. However, so that, I would say that explanation is a bit nerdy because uh, it may not really help you to understand why this can happen. It is just like, it is, it may not, sounds like an explanation, it sounds like an excuse, right? So then, um, so then maybe 
I will show you an example so that you may have a better understanding of why this could happen. So, let's consider a question like this. So, we flip a coin, and this coin uh, will win pairs with probability P. And we flip it once every minute. Then we use X to, to be the time until the coin lands half for the first time. The question is, what distribution does this X follow? So this one, actually, it seems pretty simple, right? Because uh, you flip a coin, so once you see half to stop, you know that so the number of flips will follow the metric distribution, right? But then, this, so in this question, this X, just the number of minutes, because we flip it once every minute, it's just uh, the same as the number of flips. So this X must follow the metric distribution, right? So then the probability that X is equal to K minutes should follow so this expression, right? Because, uh, which means that the first k minus one flips all tails, and the last one will be heads. And also, what is what is the expected value of x? What is the expected time until you see the first heads? So, as I explained previously, just one over p, right? So there's a Nothing new, which is just a, a trivial question. But then uh, let's modify this question a little bit. So this time we flip the coin. But this coin is just a, similar to the coin we studied when we introduced the Poisson process. So this coin we show has with probability P. So this P could be a small number. And uh, for our convenience, we use this lambda over N for this P. N is, uh, is a number. So one number. So this time, we flip this, this coin n times per minute. So in other words, we flip it once every one n minute. So you can, you can see that if n is a large number, then we need to flip it pretty frequently, right? So here, we use this, we use this uh, lambda as the product of n and p. So similar to what we discussed at one person, person distribution. And then we still use this x, this uh, capital X for the time until the coin lens has for the first time. Then let's see what distribution and the expected value for this X should have. So you see this this one actually is a it's just a, a very minor modification of the previous question, right? Previously we just uh, flip it every minute. And now we just uh, flip n times every minute minute. So this X, the number of flips could be anything from one to three, right? So this X is the is the time until first it has. So this X can take value k over n. This k could be one, two, three, and so on, right? Because we flip it every one over n minute. And uh, if it takes value k over n, which means that we need to flip it k times to see the first that has, right? What is this probability? You just follow this. Because uh, P is now equal to lambda over N, we just use uh, lambda over N to replace P. So that's it. So it's, it's simple. Then let's consider the expected value, the expected time until we see first that has. What is that? I think it's also pretty simple. Because uh, we know that 
So this expression, 1 minus p to the power of k minus 1 times p, is the probability that we need k flips, right? We need k flips means that we need k over n minutes. So this summation would be the expected time until we see the first half, right? So this is pressure. Again, this p is equal to 1 over theta. Here, but how to calculate this? Actually, it's, uh, it's also very simple. Because uh, we see, so this summation is, is about k, and it has nothing to do with, with n. So we can take this n out of the summation. If we take it out, so the remaining part would be exactly the same as this one, right? So, so this one is a k times this thing takes summation over n. So we know that so this summation would be equal to 1 over p. And uh, with this 1 over n here, so this expected value should be 1 over n times p, right? So here, we know that this n times p in our setting is equal to lambda, so which is uh, 1 over lambda, right? So this is uh, the answer of this question. But before we move on, so let's make it very clear. So here, actually, so this expected value only depends on lambda. What is lambda? Lambda is n times p, right? So what is p? What is n? p is the probability you see has. n is the number of flips each minute, right? It only depends on the probability, the product of the probability and the frequency of flip. So you may change n, you may change p, but as long as the product is the same, the expected time until we see first and half will be the same, right? Keep in mind, because later we will use this result. So again, it only depends on lambda, which is the product of n and p. So now, let's uh, do the game like this. So this time, we flip it more and more frequently. So in other words, we have this n goes to infinity. At the same time, so we keep lambda fixed. So which means that if n is larger, p needs to be smaller. In the way that n times b is a fixed number, which is lambda, right? So let's see, if we do this, what will happen? So again, x is the num is the expect is the time until we see the first of x, right? As, as we discussed just now, it can take value k over n, right, for fixed n. And then, so the probability of that is uh, it's just this one. So it's just jump, the geometric distribution, right? However, so here we know that this lambda is a fixed number. If we let n goes to infinity, let's see what will happen. So this probability, the probability that you need k over n minutes to see the first and a half should follow so this expression. For this expression, we see the first term, 1 minus lambda over n to the power of k minus 1. No matter what k is, so this term should be less than 1, right? And the second term is lambda over n. Lambda is a fixed number. When n goes large, the second term will converge to zero. So a number less than one times a number conver that conver converges to zero. So the entire probability will converge to zero as n goes to infinity, right? So what does it mean? It means that, so we play the game like this. We flip a coin. So very, very, very frequently because n is large, n is the number of flips per minute. 
And the probability that it shows has is very, very, very small. So in the sense that n times p is a moderate number, which is lambda. So in this way, so we can imagine, so this x, which is the time until we see first the hats, will converge to a limit random variable, right? And it is important that no matter what n is, what p is, as long as n times p is equal to lambda, the expected value of x is always 1 over lambda. It's always like this, right? So what does it mean? We flip it very, very frequently. But as long as n times p is fixed, the expected time until we see the first half will not change. Will always be one over one, right? But for in the limit case, so at any specific time point, the probability that you see the first half exactly at this time point will be zero, right? Because uh, no matter what k is, so this probability will converge to zero. So in the limit, it comes zero. If such a limit exists, right? So at each point, the probability that it is exactly at this point is zero. So, but, so you may think that, so which means that it will never happen, right? But however, this one shows that the expected time until we see the first half will not change. It's always one over lambda, right? So what is that? So we can, now I think uh, you will see that in the limit case, so this uh, x, the time until we see the first half actually will become a continuous random variable. Right? So, then let's, let's think of this. So now, through this uh, limiting process, so you can, you can imagine so some random variable have a limit which has the behavior described here, right? And then the question is, at each point, we know that the probability is zero. And if, if, if we wish to study the distributional behavior of that, what can we do? Right? Because at, at any specific point, the probability is zero. Then in this case, actually, it does not make any sense to think of uh, the probability that this uh, continuous random variable takes a value at any specific point. But instead, it only makes sense to talk about the probability that it takes a value within an interval. Right? So that's the idea. So in this way, you can see that if we wish to describe the distributional behavior, then we need to think of the probability that it's within a certain interval rather than uh, specific, specific sites, uh, specific points. So any interval, we call that any interval, would be uncountable set, right? So now, <coughs> next, let's see how to, how to, uh, how to describe the, the distribution over an interval for, for this random variable. Again, uh, I wrote something here. So let's let's go back to check to check uh, check x. So we're so this x here. It, this x is not it's not a limit case. It's not continuous. It's still discrete. Let's think of this. Let's think of the discrete case and how to calculate the probability that it takes a value within the interval. Then. From this, we will have an idea how to generalize this into the 
limit case for continuous run of verbals. So here, so again, this, this X is uh, the, the time until we see first the X, right? We flip n times per minute. And the probability is lambda over n. So for this case, what is the probability that X takes the value of K over n? So which means that we need K flips until we see the first the half. As we explained, uh, it follows this expression because, uh, because of geometric distribution, right? And now we wish to know what is the probability that, so this X, this renewable, takes a value between A and B. So this A and B are two positive numbers with B bigger than A. So how to calculate this? But for convenience, uh, maybe we use this uh, lowercase x to replace k over n. So we use, uh, keep in mind, we're using this lowercase x on k over n. If x is equal to k over n, so then this k should be equal to n times x, right? If it is equal to n times x, so actually, so this probability, we just uh, to calculate this probability, we just need to calculate all possible values of this lowercase x within a and b. So here, so because of this x, we only take value to be k over n, so just uh, write in this way. So k over n should be between a and b, and at each possible point, the probability, the corresponding probability should be like this, right? because uh, this n times x is equal to k. So for this expression, maybe uh, we can write, we can write it into the following form when we do a little bit of uh, expansion. So here, let's first consider, so this uh, lambda over n. So because uh, this lambda is a fixed number, and later we may let this n uh, go to infinity, right? So we just uh, take this lambda out we put it in front of the expression. If we, so then, so this lambda over n, we read it like lambda times 1 over n, right? And this term is written like uh, 1 minus lambda over n to the power of x times, so this one. So for this term, as n goes to infinity, because uh, lambda is fixed, so we, we know that this term will converge to 1, right? And what about this term? 1 over lambda, uh, 1 minus lambda over n to the power nx. So let's see, what is the limit of this one? So I do a big derivation here. We wish to know this limit, right? We just play the same trick as I explained to you for the Poisson approximation, right? So here, this nx is written as n over lambda times lambda x. So again, why bother to do so? Because uh, the limit of this term, so as I put it into this a big pair of uh, parentheses, we know that this the limit here is equal to 1 over e, right? Because it's equal to 1 over e here, limit here, so the, the the limit of, uh, of the left-hand side should be equal to e to the power of minus one to x, right? So it's, uh, it's here. So now we have uh, derived some, <coughs> some uh, limits. And you may ask me the question, so why, why, why we don't derive limits for this one over n? So as n goes to infinity, this 1 over n will converge to 0, right? So why we don't do a, uh, we, we don't do so this uh, limiting stuff for this 1 over n? Because, uh, because we need to do summation. Even if, uh, so this 1 over n will converge to 0, because this summation involves a lot of such terms. If you simply take it to 0, then the entire summation will become zero, which is wrong. You cannot do this. But 
what can you do? Actually, you may realize that when n is large, which means that 1 over n is small, in the limit, this summation will converge to an integral. Right? So, how can we see that? Actually, I think uh, I mean, it could be more convenient to write it into this form. So here, the lambda is still here. We know that this, uh, this middle term will converge to e to the power of minus lambda x. And uh, this term will converge to 1, right? This 1 over m, we can simply write it as delta x. Why is right as the delta x? This delta x stands for a little increment over each step, right? So we know that this x is defined as k over n. k could be 1, 2, 3, and so on. So accordingly, this x could be 1 over n, 2 over n, 3 over n, and so on. So each time the increment over those values would be 1 over n. Right? So, in this way, you see that this summation can, can be written in this way. So, when n goes large, each delta x will be a very, very, very small intervals. Right? We just do summation over intervals. What is that? It's an integral. Right? So, which means that as n goes to infinity, so this summation will indeed converge to this integral. The integral from a to b. The integrand is lambda times e to the power minus lambda x. So this integral. So maybe let me recap what we did just now. What do we do? We just go like this. We consider we consider the time until we see first the hat. So we flip the coin in a very, very, very frequent way. But the probability of hat is extremely small, such that n times p is equal to lambda, which is a reasonable number. So as we discussed just now, so for this x, for the verbal x, which is the time until we see the first the halves. So the probability that this time, this random time, is between the interval from a to b will converge to this integral, an integral from a to b with respect to a function. So this function is lambda times e to the power minus lambda x. So later you will see, we will call this function probability density function. Why call it density? Because if you wish to know the probability that a random variable takes a value within an interval, you just need to do a, an integration over this interval using this probability density function. That's the idea. Right? That's uh, that is this example. Maybe for you to better understand this, uh, I also plot several pictures. So what is this picture? So this picture, actually, so let's recall what we did just now. So we explained that for each x, so this x is just a number again. So here if we just flip it n times, exactly n times, so then the probability that x is within a and b should follow this expression, this summation. Right? For this summation, if we just use this, uh, if we wish to know so this, uh, the probability that it takes a uh, value within a and b, I just uh, draw a picture like this. So I draw histograms for each case with a fixed value of n. So each time, for example, the first picture is for n is equal to 4. 
So then, what is the, how to represent those probabilities? Actually, so each probability is represented by a bar, a bar like this. So you see, for example, you see the force of the bar. The height of the bar follows this expression. What is this expression? It is just a, just that part. So this part. So for each bar, the width of the bar is just 1 over n. So 1 over n, right? So the term except this 1 over n part, so this part, is the height of the bar. So here, in this case, you see each bar, the area of the each bar, corresponds to each term within the summation, right? If you wish to know the probability that x takes a value between a and b, actually you just uh, pick up the value a and pick up the value b. You just calculate the area of those bars within that interval. In this picture, I take a to be 1, b to be 3, right? Accordingly, when n is equal to 4, the probability that, so this x, the number, uh, the time until we see the first x, between 1 minute and 3 minutes, would just be the area of those blue bars, right? And then I just change the parameter. I change the parameter to 10 while I keep the lambda, which is n times p, fixed, right? In this case, so the picture will look a bit different because n is larger means the width of the bars will be smaller, right? So now, if I still wish to know what is the probability that x takes the value between 1 and 3, it should be the area of those blue bars. So then, I take n to be even bigger. So, so then we have a thinner and thinner bars. The height would just be almost the same, right? And you can imagine that actually as n goes to infinity, so the height of the bars, which is uh, which follows this expression, will converge to this expression as we discussed it just now, right? So accordingly the boundary of those bars will become this curve, this smooth curve. What is this smooth curve? It is the probability density function. So it's here. And then what is the area this random variable takes a value between 1 and 3? It is still, it is the area of this blue region, right? So just like a, so those blue regions, but it is the limit case, so which is uh, like this. So now what is the probability density function? It is just this blue curve, right, which is the limit of the boundary of those bars. So that's how to understand this probability density function. Any questions? No questions, so we can take a 10 minute break. Okay, uh, so let's move on. So, uh, the definition of uh, probability density function is like this. So, for a continuous random variable x, so it's a uh, its probability density function is uh, defined as this. If we wish to know the probability that uh, this random variable takes a value between a and b, then uh, we just need to take an integral from a to b using a function, f. So this, this f, so as, as we just did, 
So here, now this function is called the probability density function, right? What is the meaning of that? Just, uh, it's just a tool where we measure the probability of a continuous random variable uh, over an interval. And actually, uh, I think uh, I would like to mention to you that when x is a continuous random variable, and according to the definition, the probability that it takes any specific value will be zero. So which means that the probability that it takes A or B would be zero, right? So in this case, uh, if you think of this integral, it could be the probability of any of those four cases. So which means that whether we include A and B into this interval, when we wish to evaluate the probability, it does not matter, right? Whether it's an open interval, closed interval, half open, half closed, half closed, half open, all the same. The probability will not change, right? That's simply because uh, the probability that the random variable takes at n points would be zero, right? So this is uh, the definition of probability density function. And maybe uh, let's uh, have a little bit of intuitive explanation of this probability density function. So what is the, the meaning of that? So suppose that this blue curve is a probability density function. So let's think of what kind of probability it should have. So first, according to the definition, so this is a probability of a probability that a random variable takes value within the interval from A to B, should be equal to the integral, should be equal to this integral, right? If this uh, lowercase f is simply this blue curve, then the graphic interpretation of that is, uh, so this one is just the area under the curve between A and B, right? So the area of this uh, blue region would be the probability. Also, because of this probability density function is used to evaluate the probability, and uh, probabilities are always bigger or equal to zero, right? So then, as a result, this uh, probability density function should be bigger or equal to zero for all x over the entire real line. The probability density function should be above the x-axis, right? And also, uh, <coughs> if we think of uh, this uh, probability, if we take this a to be minus infinity, b to be infinity, so which means that this random variable x can take any real value. Accordingly, so this uh, probability should be equal to 1, right? And uh, because, uh, so this thing can be evaluated using this expression accordingly. So if we take an integral over the entire real line, we should have uh, 1, right? So this is, uh, <coughs> if we take this integral, it must be equal to 1. So in other words, the area below the PDF, below the curve, should be equal to 1. And also, so let's recall, it, is, it would be very interest, uh, useful to, to recall the intuitive explanation of, uh, uh, of this uh, probability density function. So if we think of uh, the probability that a random variable takes the value within a, a very, very small neighbor interval, around this lowercase x. So say this, so it takes a value within a, a very, very small interval. So which means that the length of the, this interval is delta, and delta is a, a small number, very, very small number. If we think of this, then recall that when we, when we 
study integral, and we study calculus, then we know that, so based on the interpretation of, uh, of uh, integral, so when this delta is very, very small, extremely small, then according to this integral, so this thing, this probability, should be an integral from, so this point to this point. And when delta is small, it should be roughly equal to f of x times the length of this small integral, right? When we derive integral, that's the, that's the idea. So we, I think it's useful to keep this in mind because later uh, we will, I will use uh, this interpretation to help you to establish certain uh, conceptions. So this is the, this is some properties of uh, a probability density function, right? And then, uh, <coughs> so we know that uh, for discrete random variables, we use, uh, we can use uh, a PMF, probability mass function, to describe the distribution of that. And also we can use the CDF, cumulative distribution function, right? And when, when, when I introduced the uh, CDF, I said that CDF is a more general tool because it can can be defined for for any any random variable, not just for discrete ones, not just for continuous ones, and so anything. So for so then let's recall the this uh, CDF. So the CDF again for an arbitrary random variable is just defined as the probability that random variable takes a value that is uh, less than or equal to this lowercase x. So so then, what is the relationship between the CDF and the PDF? Actually, for the continued case, it's uh, pretty straightforward. Because here, uh, the CDF is defined as uh, this probability. It takes a value less than or equal to which is x. Now how to calculate that? So just uh, following the definition of PDF, we just take the integral from minus infinity up to this lowercase x, then we got the CDF. From PDF to CDF just by this uh, integral, definite integral. From minus infinity to the point we are interested in. And then, so how can we get the PDF from CDF? Then uh, I think it's, uh, from here it's pretty clear. If this uh, CDF is just a definite integral of this PDF, then according to the fundamental theorem of calculus, so this PDF must be the derivative of CDF, right? How to get it? You just uh, take the derivative, and you have this uh, PDF. So that's, uh, I think that's, uh, that's basic results. And also, uh, <coughs> I would like to uh, know certain properties of uh, CDF. So first, uh, we know that CDF is defined to be the probability that when a variable takes a value less than or equal to this lowercase x, right? If you wish to know the probability that when a variable takes a value greater than lowercase x, what is that? It's simply 1 minus this uh, capital F of x, right? Just, just according to this uh, uh, definition. And also, uh, so you may, you may be, you could be curious that why I always, I, I prefer uh, to write the interval in, in such a way. So when we think of the probability, why I wish to let this uh, uh, variable be bigger than A but less than or uh, bigger than, uh, less than or equal to B. Why I prefer to use this way? Because uh, if I write the probability in this way, so it is exactly equal to f of b minus f of a. Because uh, this probability can be written like this, and it is equal to the difference uh, of the CDF at two points. Right? So that's, uh, uh, I think, uh, it is simpler. 
the other cases in this sense. These are some uh, basic results uh, on uh, CDF, and uh, it's for all random variables, no matter continuous, discrete, or whatever. So you can, you can, you can use, use those properties safely. Uh, <coughs> maybe uh, before I move on, so maybe let, let me, uh, let's, let's do a, a very simple exercise uh, question. So the question is like this. So suppose we have a, a random variable x, so which is a continuous one, and uh, it has a it has a CDF f sub x, and uh, it has a, a PDF, so there's a lowercase uh, f x, and uh, so if we know this, so what is the PDF of uh, two times x? This random variable y. Y is just uh, two times x. So how, how can we use uh, the CDF and the PDF of x to derive the CDF to derive the PDF of the two times x? Right. So that's a uh, this question. <coughs> so to get this, uh, how to how to solve this? Maybe we can think a, a little bit about about the. Uh, definition of the PDF and CDF. What is PDF? The PDF is just a density. It's just a, a function you may need when you do integral, right? So actually, the definition of that uh, may not be may not be may not be easy to handle in a straightforward way. But for CDF, CDF could be very nice. Because uh, the definition of CDF is uh, pretty straightforward. It is such the probability that a variable takes a value less than or equal to a certain given value, right? So here, we know the distribution of x. We wish to know the distribution of 2 times x. If you use this uh, CDF, then you just, uh, you just plug in the definition. It could be pretty straightforward. And it would be great that we know that the PDF is just a derivative of CDF. So how to solve this problem? We just uh, first to find out the CDF of Y. Why is so? Because uh, the definition of uh, CDF is clear, a straightforward, right? And through, once you know the CDF, you just take the derivative, and then you can get the PDF. And that's the, that's the idea. So let's see. So can we do this? So first, <coughs> so as I said, we first try to find out the, the CDF of Y. What is CDF of Y? By definition, it's uh, just a probability when a variable Y takes uh, a value less than or equal to a given value, right? So here, uh, because of this Y, what is this Y? Y is simply 2 times X, right? If y less than or equal to this guy, which means that 2x less than or equal to this guy. So 2x less than or equal to this guy is uh, x less than or equal to y over 2, right? So what is this? It is uh, just uh, the CDF of uh, the verbal x at y over 2, right? You see that? Uh, by using CDF, you can, you can, it is pretty simple to get the CDF of a random variable y. And then next, uh, how, to, how to derive the PDF of y? Uh, we just need to take derivative, right? Derivative is the CDF of y, uh, take derivative of, uh, with respect to y. And what is this uh, CDF? It's, uh, it's written this way, right? So then we just need to calculate so this derivative. So how can we calculate this? Let me, let me remind you, I think it's uh, here uh, because uh, uh, it is a function uh, of y over 2. It is not simply for y. So then to, to evaluate this derivative, we need to use the, the chain rule. So what is the chain rule? Maybe uh, I think let me remind you. So it will be, uh, <coughs> so 
for our convenience, maybe we can write this one y over 2 as z, right? And then we know that this uh, PDF is this uh, derivative, right? Derivative, so uh, this derivative is uh, a function of z to the derivative for y, right? And then next we need to use chain rule. How, how can we get this? It is equal to the derivative with respect to z times the derivative of z for y, right? That, that's the chain rule. If you cannot remember this, so please go back to check your calculus textbook. So you need to you need to know this. And uh, what is the first term? The first term is simply because it is a derivative of cf of x, it is simply the pdf of x and z, right? And the second term is because z is equal to y over 2, the second term is simply 1 half, right? So then we just plug in uh, y over 2 to replace z, then we have this expression, so which is the pdf of y, right? So, I would like to use this uh, example to remind you that so for, 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 for us to study this uh, continuous learning variables, it will be very, very important for you to be able to do integral, to take derivatives. If you cannot remember everything clearly, then please go back to check your checklist textbook. But I think, uh, uh, at least for the purpose of exams, you need to know how to do integration and uh, derivatives for polynomials, right? If you don't know that, it's not good. And also for exponential functions. Again, integration and derivatives for polynomials and uh, exponential functions. If you don't know other functions, say, sine, cosine, tangent, whatever, it does not matter. I will cover that in my course. But at least polynomials, exponential functions, you must know. Okay? And then actually, uh, <coughs> so from this uh, very simple exercise, uh, we can have more general results. So for example, if uh, we know x is a continuous learning variable, and we know the PDF of that, how can we derive the PDF of a function of x, right? So the result is, uh, is in this proposition. So this proposition, the result seems a bit, I mean, not seem very simple, but actually the idea will be just the same as we discussed just now. So first, that we find out the, the, the CDF of a function of the given word variable. And using this CDF, we take a derivative, and then we got the PDF. So the proof, I think, is on the next slide. But because the idea would just be the same, I think uh, I don't bother to, to, to go over the detail of the proof. I just leave it to you. So then, let's talk about the expected value of uh, <coughs> continuous random variable. So we know how to calculate the expected value of a discrete random variable, right? So how to calculate that? It's just like this. So for a discrete random variable x, we just need to take a summation over all possible values this random variable can take. And at each possible value, lowercase x, so this x should be weighted by the corresponding probability mass function, right? So that's the definition of uh, expected value of uh, the square run variable. So how can we do that for a uh, continuous run variable? So if uh, this, this time x is continuous, then what do we need to do is to take an integral from minus infinity to infinity, so over the entire row line, over the entire real line at each point x, so x should be x times the density. 
and uh, we'll take this integral like this, right? So that's the way for the continuous case. Then you ask me the question, how to understand this, right? So actually, if you compare this expression with uh, discrete case, you try to observe this, and you can see some similarity. See here, actually, for the discrete case, you just take all possible values for x, right? But for a continuous case, you just take the entire real lot, right? So, and uh, at each possible value for discrete case, it's evaluated. So, it's weighted by the, the density, uh, the probability mass function there, right? But here is x times fx dx. fx dx, what does it mean? We call that, when we do integral, how to interpret this term. What is dx? dx should be understood as a small, small interval, right? Just, uh, what is that? It's a, as I explained just now, it is just, just this guy, right? fx times a small delta. So it represents, roughly speaking, it is just the probability that the run of variable takes a value within a small, small neighborhood of this lowercase x, right? That's the interpretation. So again, fx times a very small length of the integral, which is roughly equal to the probability that this random variable takes a value within this small, small interval, right? So then let's uh, come back here. So this term, fx times dx, as I explained, it stands for the probability that the random variable takes a value within a very, very small neighborhood of uh, lowercase x, right? So then, what does this integral mean? Essentially, we know that this uh, integral is just uh, a generalized case of a summation, right? So you see, this fx, fx times ds corresponds to this dx term. It stands for the probability that when a variable takes a value within a small neighborhood of lowercase x, right? We take an integral, actually, it means we take a summation over the entire real line. So you see the correspondence between this expression and this expression. The principle will be the same. But for a different case, we need to use different tools. For this three, uh, for this three case, because, because we can list all possible values, we just need to do summation, the most straightforward way. But because for the continuous case, the set of values is uncountable, what can we do? We do integral, right? So that's the idea. The idea will be the same. So another <coughs> a very useful result is how to evaluate the expected value of a function of a continuous random variable, right? Mm. So I would say the idea would just be the same. What is the expected value of h of x? So what do we need to do is just uh, take an integral, right? And actually, we just use the same idea. At each value, we first evaluate the function of this random variable. We, we evaluate the value. And it is weighted by the probability that, so this random variable takes value within a small neighborhood around lowercase x, right? So see, <coughs> so this one actually will be the same. So follow the same principle as, uh, as the discrete case. So, and, and also for, uh, we can define the variance uh, and standard deviation for continuous random variables, right? And the uh, definition will be just the same. 
expected values uh, for a vertebral menace. Uh, its expected value will take a square, right? In this case, because it's continuous, if we wish to calculate that, we need to take an integral, right? <coughs> and also, no matter if it's uh, continuous or discrete, the variance is used to measure the variability of the random variable, right? So you have a bigger variance means uh, you would take, you, uh, you would have a bigger chance to take a value away from the expected value, away from the center, right? And also the same shortcut formula uh, is uh, applicable. So you can, you can always can do that in this way. And next, let's introduce uh, <coughs> some special uh, special form of uh, random variables. So, for example, uh, this is uh, the first case is the continuous uniform random variable. So, what is that? So, this random variable is defined over an interval from A to B. So, A is less than B. And uh, for continuous random variables, uh, usually we define them through their ability density functions, right? For this continuous uniform uh, random variable, the probability density function should follow so this expression. So this PDF is non-zero only when it takes a value within this interval from A to B. So if it's not within this interval, so this, uh, this PDF is simply zero, so which is the <coughs> the definition of a continuous uh, uniform uh, random variable. So, again, the PDF uh, follows this formula, f of x. So when x takes the value between a and b, within that interval, it is equal to 1 over b minus a. Otherwise, it's 0. So, <coughs> The picture of that looks like that. So we use this uh, uh, this curve in dark green for the PDF, right? So if it's uh, if it's within uh, the interval from A to B, it takes a value. It takes a constant value one over B minus A. Otherwise, it is simply zero. Then you may ask me the question: Why? So this. Uh, so within this interval, the density must be equal to 1 over b minus a. Because uh, as I explained, for a function to be a PDF, so first, it must take a negative value, right? It must be above the x-axis. And also, the area below this curve, the total area below this curve must be equal to 1, right? Because it only takes a non-zero value from a to B, and uh, when it is a uh, constant, we need to make sure that the area of uh, the green region is exactly equal to 1, right? That's why it must be equal to 1 over uh, B minus A, right? Because the length is B minus A. And also, uh, <coughs> I think uh, you need to memorize that. So given this, uh, given this uh, probability density function, the expected value of uh, continuous uh, uniform is exactly at the center point uh, of this interval, so which is uh, a plus b over 2. The center point is also the expected value. So I think on the, uh, I think on my slides, I give you the, derivation of, uh, of uh, expected value, um, I, but I think it's, uh, I leave it to you. I put it here because uh, I wish to remind you how to do, how to do an integral. And uh, so in case that you cannot follow this, then go back to check your calculus textbook. So this is the, uh, this is how to calculate the expected value and uh, how to calculate the, the variance 
by using the uh, shortcut formula. And I would say uh, it is also useful to, to memorize the variance of uh, continuous uniform distribution, so which is a 1 uh, b minus a squared over 12, right? The length of the interval takes squared over 12. So that's a, this is the variance. And also, uh, so let's check the... <coughs> The CDF of that, how to calculate the CDF. So uh, CDF, by definition, which is just uh, the probability the random variable takes the value less than or equal to lowercase x, right? And also, uh, if you know the PDF, it is simply equal to this, uh, this integral. How to calculate this integral? So for this, uh, uh, for this PDF, you can see that at different intervals, it takes, it takes different values for this CDF. When, it is equal, when, when x is less than a, is 0. When it's bigger than b, is 0. When it's uh, within a and b, it's a constant value. So because of this, if you wish to know the CDF, you need to discuss uh, when x within different values or within different intervals, right? If x is less than or equal to a, in this case, then according to this expression, we just uh, take the integral in 0, which is 0, right? Take it equal to 0. I forgot to put down here, but it's equal to 0. And if uh, x is within uh, interval between a and b, so first we need to take the integral from minus infinity to a because uh, over this interval, the density is 0. And then from a to x, the density is 1 over b minus a, right? The first integral is 0, and the second integral, according to this, because it's a constant, you take it out, then it's x minus a over b minus a. So it is like this. And if x is bigger than b, bigger than b, we just uh, will follow the same idea, Consider case by case, from minus infinity to a, the density is 0. From a to b, it is 1 over b minus a. And from b to x, is back to 0, right? So in this case, we just calculate each term, which is 0, 1, and 0, which is equal to 1, right? So this, which is the, so this is the, the CDF of the uh, uniform random variable. So according to this uh, uh, expression, you see that the CDF actually should have this, uh, should look like this. So it starts from 0, and it's always 0 uh, until it reaches A. And from A to B, it's, uh, it's a straight line until it reaches 1 uh, at B, and then they keep constant at 1. So this is the, the shape of, uh, of CDF. And then maybe uh, let's do uh, a simple exercise of, uh, of uh, uh, for a uniform, continuous uniform random variable. So if uh, we have a continuous uniform random variable uh, which is defined over the interval from A to B, then what is the probability that so it takes a value from another interval from C to D? So for example, for different cases, and they take different values. So let's see this. So here, so in the first case, let's consider the case that C and D both are within A and B, right? C, D, C, C, uh, C and D here. So in this case, actually, if we wish to know the probability that it takes a value within the integral from C to D. According to the definition of a probability density function, we just need to take the integral, right? Take the integral. Uh, so the density within this interval is just uh, 1 over B minus A, right? So you see, you see in this case, it's simply, so the area of this uh, uh, pink region, right? So 
this pink region is just uh, B minus C over B minus A. So this is the first case. And the second case, actually, at, uh, if uh, A less than C less than B less than B. So then what will happen? If we still wish to know the probability that X takes the value uh, between C and B. So in this case, you see that A, B, C, D should, should be listed in, so like this, A, C, D, D, right? So then, you see in this case, actually because uh, we wish to know the probability uh, in fixed value between C and D, so we know that it should be the P area below the CDF curve from C to D. Right, but because uh, uh, from A to B, so it's uh, it's, uh, it's positive from B, uh, from B to D is zero. So in this case, you only need to take the integral from C to B, right? So in this case, the probability would be B minus C over B minus A, right? So I think it's a uh, it's pretty simple and. Uh, and actually, I just wish to use that to, to remind you of the integral. So there's another uh, exercise example, but I think it because it's very simple, I would just leave it to you. So then uh, <coughs> let's uh, discuss a little bit about another runner variable, which you call exponential runner variable. So what is an exponential random variable? The definition of that is like this. So uh, x is called uh, exponential random variable with rate lambda. So here it has only one parameter, and this parameter is called rate. So with rate lambda, if it's a probability density function, it's given like this. So when x is positive, the density is also uh, positive lambda times e to the power minus lambda x. So this is uh, the, the positive part. If x less than zero, then the density is simply zero. So which means that for a uh, exponential random variable, it must take positive values, right? And uh, if you check this expression, so I'm sure that looks very uh, familiar to you, right? So what is that? It is exactly what we discussed at the beginning uh, of this uh, of this lecture. Of, uh, so here, it is here, right? So you see this uh, lambda times e to the power of minus lambda x. And uh, how to understand this uh, the natural random variable? Maybe so let's. Uh, Let's come back to this example. So recall that, what is this example? What do we did here? What do we did here is like, just like this. We flip a coin. For this coin, the probability of has is extremely small, right? P is very small. What we did is that, so each minute, we flip it n times. This n is a large number, right? N times B, which is equal to lambda, which is the rate of uh, exponential random variable. Lambda is called the rate, right? And uh, for if we do that in this way, so we flip it very, very frequently, then we argue that in the limit, so, so this X, which is the time until we see the first half, right? It will become a continuous random variable that has a probability density function given by this expression, right? So see, what is the exponential random variable? What is that? You flip a coin frequently. The time until we see the first half will become exponential random variable, right? So that's the exponential random variable.
So that is here. And, uh, and uh, uh, what is the CDF of that? CDF is just a, you just take the integral of this uh, uh, PDF, right? But I think I leave it as an access for you. So why you need to know how to do uh, integral, how to do integration, how to do, uh, how to take derivative for exponential functions? Because in the exam, uh, I, will, I will test you about this uh, exponential derivative. So if you don't know that, maybe, maybe it's not good, right? And then, what is the expected value of this uh, exponential derivative? Well, as we explained previously, right, if we flip it very frequently, so as n goes to infinity, t goes to zero, as long as n times t is equal to lambda, then the average time, the expected time that you receive first pass is always one over lambda. It's there, right? So expected value of an exponential random variable is one over lambda. And the variance of that is one over lambda squared. So how to derive this, I, I think uh, just uh, I will skip that. So this is some basic uh, <coughs> uh, basic property and the definition of uh, exponential random variable. So this uh, uh, exponential random variable also has the memorlessness property. So to to introduce uh, so so this property maybe you must recall memorless property for geometric distribution, right? I think that two weeks ago <coughs> when we discussed geometric distribution, I said geometric random variable is uh, is uh, memorless. So, what does it mean? It means that, so, so maybe let's recall what is a geometric distribution? What is a geometric random variable? Geometric random variable is a number of flips that you will see first and halves, right? So, what is the uh, memorlessness of a uh, geometric random variable? Actually, it just uh, states the fact like this. So when you flip the coin, so you wish to know when we will see the first hats, right? Then each time, as long as you see tails, then this situation will be the same as you begin to flip it from the very beginning. Each time you flip it, as long as you see tails, you just like a stop and mean, right? No matter how many tails you have seen, it won't increase or decrease the chance you will see has next time, right? So because of this, so the probability that you need n flips until you see the first has, so this unconditional probability will be the same as the conditional probability that you have already seen n flips, but you still need to see additional n flips until you first the hands, right? So that's a very simple fact, but it's called um, memorlessness of geometric distribution. Then, <coughs> how did we derive this uh, uh, exponential random variable? As I explained, I just uh, flip the coin in an extremely frequent way, right? And the, the time, so this, the time until you see the first half will follow exponential distribution, right? So then, <clears throat> let's think of a case like this. You flip it. You have flipped it like zero minutes. You haven't seen the first half. What is the probability that you will need additional x minutes until you see the first x? Actually, it will be the same situation as the geometric distribution, right? You have flipped 
I have zero limits. Each time, as long as you see tails, you start a new, right? Even if in the past you haven't seen has, it won't change the chance you see has or you see the first that has to be in the next minute, right? Because of this, with the probability that you need an additional X minutes will be the same as you flip from the very beginning. You need X minutes until you see the first that has, right? So this property is called memorlessness. But on this slide, I explained that using uh, <coughs> another slide. So if we consider a lifetime of a component or a machine part or, or whatever or something, so suppose that it, it follows an uh, exponential distribution with very lambda, then <coughs> we know that the probability that, so, it, so probability is bigger than a given value of lowercase x, so it would be 1 minus f of x, right? So it's according to the definition of CDF. And because the CDF is, uh, is given by this, so this probability will be equal to e to the power of minus uh, lambda x. And then let's think of the question. So if uh, so this um, component has been working for x zero hours, what is the probability that it lasts more than additional x hours? I think a standard way is just to, <coughs> to follow uh, the definition of conditional probability, so which is very similar uh, to what we did for geometric distribution. So essentially, we wish to know, so this probability, this conditional probability. And uh, according to the definition of uh, uh, conditional probability, it is equal to the probability of intersection over the probability of the condition, right? For the <coughs> probability of the intersection, if the random variable is bigger than x0 plus x, and x0, uh, and the random variable is bigger than x0, as long as the first event happens, the second event must happen. So then, so the intersection of these two is just the first event, right? And according to this, the numerator, so we can use this result. The numerator is just uh, e to the power of minus lambda times x0 plus x. The denominator is, uh, so this guy, then in the end, so it will be equal to e to the power of minus lambda x, which is equal to the unconditional probability that the random variable takes the value bigger than x, right? So you see, I just uh, repeated what I did for geometric distribution, but in a different setting. So here, uh, <coughs> so this is the, 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 the property of uh, uh, exponential distribution. So actually, I wish to, I wish to, um, I wish to help you to, to establish a connection between this uh, exponential distribution and the Poisson distribution. I think uh, uh, during the break, some of you asked, asked me a question related to this. I think so from here, uh, now we have the required pieces to do so. Uh, so again, so let's recall what we did when we construct Poisson distribution. What we did is just like this. So we argued that Poisson distribution is just a <laughs> approximation of binomial distribution. What is a binomial distribution? We flip a coin n times the number of has follows the binomial distribution, right? What is the Poisson distribution? We flip a coin, but this coin is a bit special. P is very small, so that we need this n to be very big, right? As long as n times p, which is equal to lambda, is a, a reasonable number, a moderate number, then we argue that, so this distribution actually will follow a Poisson distribution. The number of hats will follow a Poisson distribution, right? We flip the coin very, very, very frequently. The number of hats will follow a Poisson distribution. So how did we construct this exponential distribution? Let's flip this uh, special 
It's a natural call, right? And now this takes the natural and the verbal is the top until we see first the hats. Right? So what is a poisson? Number of hats within a period of time. So each minute we flip n times, right? So within each minute we may see a number of hats which will follow Poisson distribution. Right? The time until the first has follow its financial distribution. Right? So then you see the connection. What is the Poisson? What is the exponential? If we consider a period of time, the number of occurrences will follow Poisson distribution. Right? The time between occurrences will follow exponential distribution. You see that? So I also argue that, so if we wish to model a number of earthquakes within the region, that's a Poisson distribution, right? So here you can see that the time until the next earthquake, the time between earthquakes should follow exponential distribution. This exponential distribution is numerous. So what does it mean? It means that, so no matter, so say, uh, no matter when the previous earthquake happened, say, whether five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the time until the next earthquake would follow, would follow the same distribution as the earthquakes just happened, the previous earthquakes just happened yesterday. Right? Because of memorlessness. So, again, it means that no matter when the previous earthquake happened, it won't change the probability that it will have you will have you will see an earthquake next year within the next period of time because of this anomalous, because of the nature of uh, this phenomenon. It's just like a flipping a coin. So no matter how many tails you have seen, it won't change the chance that you will see the has, the first has within the next period of time. Right? So that's the connection between the uh, some distribution and uh, exponential distribution. Questions? So I think if there are no questions, uh, we can stop here and uh, see you next week. <laughs>